Hello there, ladies and gentlemen of Dartmouth. I'm Oliver. And I'm Caitlin. And this is the first episode of The Gathering. Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> oh, this is this so is like, this is so new. Oh, well, it's, it's at least going to be more casual than yeah. this, this stuck up tribe thing. Yeah. yeah. Casually creates a rivalry. Yeah. Nah. But wel welcome to The Gathering. Yeah. This is a podcast where we will talk about stuff like pretty much every other podcast that has ever existed ever. Pretty much. We're just, it's just going to be us talking some Screaming music. into a microphone. Yes. Absolutely. So chill music. Chill music <laughs> with some screamo. Perfect combination. I don't think anyone wants to hear screamo. Honestly, like, I respect people who actually genuinely love screamo music. Because like, I can't. I can't deal with that. Why would you be able to? It's just them screaming. Yeah. But, like, anyone who can listen to that without getting, like, angry or, like, annoyed has, like, some strength to them <laughs> like if you can listen to screamo you are strong like i cannot <laughs> i cannot do that like it there's, there's a lot of music that's just really hard to listen to yeah but scream like i can't get behind rock like even classical rock i have a you hard can't. time getting behind like i even with like elton john or something see i kind of like classic rock because it's such like it it's like you when you listen to it it's just like so like wow this was like I don't really know how to this describe it. This was cool it. It was back like then. This was cool back then. Like, this is what... It's like, part of our history. Yeah. Like, wow, this is, like, like really good, like, classic rock. Like, you get, like, this feeling of... Um, nostalgia? Like you, or, like... Yeah, or, well, it's not really nostalgia. It's, it's more really, like... But, like, it's, like, when you're, when you're like, it's a like, little it's like kid like and you're listening with, yeah. to, like, your parents' songs, and then you kind of get, like, wow, this is what my parents listen to. And I'm enjoying like, it, I'm kind enjoying of. I'm enjoying it. Like not like expected so the thing that i that i usually run into is that ow sorry about that uh. Ooh. <laughs> technical like, difficulties sounds already like a mini stampede the tiniest stampede yeah just like a bunch so, of ants uh our theme for today is going to be hindsight yeah uh seriously like I've done a lot of things in my life that I regret, yeah. and I'm pretty sure I, you have too. I think about a lot of things that I've done, and I'm like, mm, I could have done a bit better. <laughs> Just, yeah. Like, we as sentient beings are privileged yeah. to be able to actually think That's about stuff That's why I like history so much. It's because about think about history, while it's sad learning about all these atrocities that have occurred in the past, it's really good learning material. Like, what can we do better? We can look back in our history and just improve, improve, improve. Yeah, it's it's going to keep... But actually, history is just absolutely terrifying because yeah. we actually don't know who wrote it, yep. but we're learning about it anyway. Um, no, but but on the, even on the smaller scale, we can we as humans look back on our actions like yeah. all the time and we mm -hmm. see... What we have done wrong and what we really can do to advance forward. And it's yeah. just a um, ridiculous cycle of just ever learning. And some people don't even think about it at all, which yeah. is... Yeah, which I find what? I find completely strange. Like, I don't know how you can just go on and be like, yeah, that happened, whatever. See, if, if I do things, I'm always going to question it. I'm like, is this the best choice I can make? Is there a better one? Or is this, like, peace? Is this good? No, we should always question whatever the heck yeah. we're doing. But I feel like that would be a, a better society if we always questioned what we did. Well, it just like, thinking would be a start because yeah. most people don't actually do that. Yeah. Instead of people, there's some people out there that just do, do, do. And while that can like be good sometimes, like sometimes it's better to do actions and like speak words. But most of the time in real life, we need to think about our actions because mm. that will always have a consequence, whether it be in the short <laughs> run, the long run, something's going to happen. Yes. The the most prominent example I can think of would probably be like relationships. Yeah. Because you really, people really Definitely. need to actually have conversations. Yeah. In relationships. Like we need to, we need to set up boundaries. But people never 
think about like, oh, what did I do wrong in this relationship? They just think, yeah. oh my God, it's so like the other person's fault. My ex was crazy. Oh, Becky. Be- <laughs> Becky. Veronica. <laughs> just the, those names that are just screaming. Yeah. Prep girl type deal. And then there's like the whole relationship where you know the one where they always they break up, they get back together, they break, break up, up they get back, get back together. together. But it's like it's yeah. not something's wrong and something's, something's not wrong. working. You need or to or you need to stop breaking up and just deal with it. Communicate, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, no. This generation just doesn't understand it. <laughs> wow, I'm talking to this generation and we yeah. still don't understand it. I'm sorry, you are like a part of this generation. Shh, nobody needs to know that. For all they know, I'm actually no. I've been the tribe. Yeah. That's I unfortunate. Don't, no, um, no, absolutely. The tribe would let a forty-year-old man on the tribe. Yeah, like, totally. A, <laughs> what is your take on the high school issues? I think it's stupid. <laughs> we should be fishing instead. We need to get the fishing economy up. <laughs> fishing instead? I didn't know I was a forty-year-old fisherman. I mean, we're in Dartmouth, okay? We're in South Coast. Everyone's a fisherman. But like. <laughs> oh my God, we're we're getting off track. Yeah. What? <laughs> Talking about fishermen. So when when I was um when I was a kid, I I remember this story. Uh, I didn't understand. I didn't have a permanence at all. Yeah. This was when I was like three. Mm-hmm. My dad came back from a trip, and I ran up and I hugged his leg. I was like, Ah, I thought you were dead. <laughs> it was great. But in, in like thinking about it, it's like. That was me. Yeah. And to think about something like that in your past, it's just... It's just... It's, it's it doesn't like, feel like you. Yeah. Like, when I look back and I remember all the things, like, I remember when I was younger, I thought clouds were made out of mashed potatoes because I watched a cartoon. And I was so... Im- it's so, like, like Im- amazing to know how impressionable I was at such a young age. And just looking back, like, wow, I actually thought that? Those are my thoughts. Really? <laughs> what like, what was I doing? What was I doing? But but it's still under the We're yeah. still very impressionable. Yeah. Because it's like we're still growing and we're still thinking and we're still just learning about how this world around us works. Yeah. And some people absolutely never learn how mm-hmm. the world around us works. One thing that will never change with age is that we're always looking for something to reassure us. Because as for children, it's we look to adults, and as adults, we sometimes look to other adults, and it just so on. Like we always look to something. We always have like a guiding rule to guide us through this life. Because life is basically chaos. <laughs> Isn't it like the same thing as? Well, we try to bring a lot to it, but it doesn't yeah. work out too well. Yeah. Most big things usually come crumbling yeah. down. But that's like one of the more admirable traits of humanity is that if we fail at something, we try again. That's maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. I think maybe we're just I think we're just we're too just persistent for our own yeah. Good. We're <laughs> we've only been around for what one yeah. point eight m- million years or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and that you know that may seem long, but like compared to the history of like four point eight yeah billion years, it's nothing. It's like a minute. Like it's a it's a minute in the day of life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. I mean, like, and you were talking about the persistence of humanity. I, I you were saying like it may be like not good, but like think of like the good things. Like we we landed on the moon. Like we wouldn't we have probably landed. Probably weren't the first. Pe- um, probably pe- I mean beings to have done this. Yeah, but as humans. Only oh talking yeah, about humans. we are <laughs> we an landed isolated on the incident. <laughs> yeah, but like, God, I'm just now you've got me thinking about like extraterrestrial life. Like, it's so like <laughs> radical to think of like there's more life out there than just us. Well, the universe is infinite yeah. as we understand it, and then if we continue to search, maybe we'll actually find something. I don't yeah. know. Maybe the aliens will be pretty cool. Yeah. Maybe they want to want to rip our heads off. I don't know. Let's, let's hope they don't ask about the stuff we sent into space years ago. Like all the video, like the like the diagram. <laughs> oh wait, that was that might have just been from a movie. I don't know if they ever sent any footage of video games up into the. 
I don't I don't know about like um, oh, that might have just been that I think stupid just, Adam Sandler movie. <laughs> no, 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 I think they they sent then they I thought they sent like a like a diagram of like two like humans like naked humans and it's just, like a diagram and like a bun- like a, a recording of a sound I guess. Was that like the Leonardo da Vinci thing? I don't know. I don't know. I, just, I don't know either. I don't. I, you're the one who's you're the one who brought this up. Austin, I you know I've read about it. It's just do more research. <laughs> You know, yeah, okay, whatever. I just I thought think, it'd be interesting. I think this is a good place to end off this section. Thank, okay, yeah. thank you, whoever decided to actually sit through our... Ramblings. The complete and utter ramblings of these two imbeciles. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we'll be right back with an interview with Mr. Tebow. Welcome back. My guest today is Ross Debo, former vice principal of Oxford High and current principal of Dartmouth High School, and he's just now finishing up his first year. He's been an educator since graduating from UMass Dartmouth with a, gr- with a degree in history, right? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. And um, actually, I was former vice principal at Durfee High School. I was principal of Oxford High School for oh, three were... years before joining us here. Oh, yeah. okay. I misread that somewhere. Uh, <laughs> So I wanted to start out by asking, um, you know, actually, no, this, where'd you grow up? So I grew up in Swansea, Massachusetts. Uh, I've lived 34 of my 35 years on this planet <laughs> in Swansea. Uh, there was one year that I lived in an apartment in Somerset, Mass. Um, but yeah, Swansea. So Southeastern Mass my whole life. I did attend Dartmouth, um, UMass Dartmouth, rather, uh, which is where I got my undergrad degree in history. So... We we really as students we don't really get exposed to a lot of like you as a person and you as a you, you as a kid. So what was what was like something that really influenced you as a child? As a child, uh, I would say athletics. Um, I have always loved football. I think it's the ultimate team game, and I think football is really a great uh, metaphor for life. Um, it's one of the sports that you know. Certainly, I'm not a super athlete, but I work hard. I'm intelligent. Uh, and as a result of that, there was a role for me. Um, and so uh, football, I would have to say, is definitely one of the major uh, influences on my life. And then I would also say that uh, school, um, uh, you know, I, I 
was a very good student from like fourth grade on. Um, like most <laughs> boys, elementary school, I had a lot of energy, and so it just, it just really couldn't be contained. And... Yeah, so K through K through three was was a little bit difficult, but in fourth grade, um, I had an outstanding teacher, Mrs. Fadden, um, who really took an interest in me, and from that point on, uh, school was another one of those very positive uh, influences. Um, on my life. Didn't you also become a coach at one point? I did. I coached football at Case High School, um, which is where I graduated from in Swansea. Um, and again, I, I coached football for uh, six or seven years. Um, and the only reason why I left was because I got into administration. And so the time commitment, um, I, I just couldn't continue the time commitment that was involved in coaching football. But again, um, I, I would say coaches had a major influence on my life too growing up. Um, is that know. what made you want to try and become an educator? It is. So when I first uh, got out of high school and went off to college, I went to Assumption College for a year first, uh, and I was a history major. And at that point in my life, I was thinking that I would maybe pursue a law degree. Uh, and so at Assumption, I was going to actually double major in history and business and then likely go on to a law degree. Um, what ended up happening was I was a little bit homesick at Assumption. Um, you know, I did fine, was doing well academically, but I was coming home on a lot of weekends and I was working. The other um, piece that um, I'm not ashamed to share is that uh, I come from a, a working class family, so money was tight growing up. Um, and certainly my both my mom and dad sacrificed so that I never had to go without, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but at the end of my freshman year, even with uh, an academic scholarship I had a decision to make. I could either stay at Assumption where I wasn't that happy um, and I would have been $80,000 in debt <laughs> when I graduated, um, and that's before a law degree, <laughs> um, or I could transfer to UMass Dartmouth and for the next three years, you know, I, I my final three years at UMass Dartmouth cost the same as my freshman year at Assumption did. So it was much more cost uh, efficient to go to UMass Dartmouth it was once I transferred home, um, there was a coaching vacancy at Case High School, uh, and I was approached and asked if I was interested in coaching the freshman football team, and of course I was, um, and so then that's how I, you know, I said, well, if I'm going to coach, I need to teach, or else you won't be able to coach, um, and so that's what really got me into... So, so it was um, a matter of circumstance of that. It, it was, and also though, again, I had a lot of great teachers in my life. Um, I had a lot of great teachers... Um, really from fourth grade on, um, you know, and I consider myself very fortunate because they invested their time and energy in me, and, um, you know, I just thought that it made a lot of sense from that perspective to give back. Um, and again, teachers are often not, they're not thanked enough, and so educators do a lot for, um, for young people, and it's, one of those things where, you know, uh, teenagers don't always appreciate it in the moment. Um, and then when you get beyond a certain age, you kind of look back and say, oh, that was cool. Right. That was cool. And I'm so th lucky I had and fill in the blank because um, teachers really do create a lot of opportunities for, for our kids. So, so I want to move on and I want to ask about um, your family today. Uh, you, you mentioned to us in the blog post that you initially posted last year that you had a family at home. Two daughters, right? Wife I have two daughters, daughters Bella, uh, who will be seven this coming September. She's just finishing up her kindergarten year at Hoyle Elementary School in Swansea. And then uh, Sophia, who just turned three in May um, and is at Little Red Preschool in Somerset. Yeah. Do you feel like having kids has improved your ability to administrate here at, at a at a higher level high school? Um, it certainly allows me to see um, one of the um, aspects of my job as principal is parents, you know, often will call when they have concerns. Um, and so certainly it has absolutely allowed me um, to put myself in their shoes when there's an issue with their child. You know, it's not, I have the ability to see it as a principal. I have the ability to see it as a former teacher, but I can also now see it as a parent. You know, and those are often very different lenses. And so, from that aspect, it certainly helped uh, me in my role as administrator for sure. Um, but right now, there's the young that it's really you know the ones that are in elementary, ones in preschool. So, have you ever had to make one of those concerned parent calls? 
No. So again, I'm very fortunate <laughs> that um, you know Bella has an absolutely fantastic teacher, Miss Askla, uh, at Hoyle Elementary School. She loves school, um, Bella. Um, and our youngest, Sophia, as I said, just started preschool. Um, it is funny because they are two very different um, children. Um, Sophia, so Bella, because of her birthday being in September, is one of the oldest children in her kindergarten class. And Sophia, starting uh, preschool at two years, nine months, um, was is one of the youngest in her class. And so they're very uh, different. Um, you know, so no, I haven't had to make a concerned parent <laughs> call, but I am learning that they're two very different children. Awesome. So, high school for you, what was that like go going through? Sure. So, again, as I mentioned, from fourth grade on, I really loved school from that point on. Um, and mostly because I started, you know, to have some success and I was, you know, um, doing well academically. And then as I got into high school, I played football, I played athletics. I was also involved in um, the National Honor Society. I, I was president of the National Honor Society. I was a member of several different clubs and activities. So I really enjoyed my high school experience. Um, and it really, um, one of the things that I think about any good high school is that they provide a lot of different opportunities for kids. So regardless of what your interests are, you find something you can plug into. And certainly that was my experience at Case High School. There was, you know, between athletics, um, I was on the sound crew uh, for the theater production um, a couple of theater productions during my time at Case High School. Um, so yeah, I love. I mean, I loved high school. I, I absolutely loved it. And again, um, had a lot of great teachers that that worked with us. So, did you have any defining struggles for you? Like something that you really had trouble with, either either emotionally or academically. That just and then it kind of ended up resolving itself. Or how did you resolve that type of issue? Hmm. Well, I can say that in high school, no, I really did not have any um, defining struggles. I did, I was very close to my mama and Pepe growing up, um, as well as my grandmother and grandfather. Um, and during high school, I, I lost, um, you know, my Pepe passed away and my grandfather passed away. And they certainly had, up until that point, had a major impact on my life. Um, and so that was a little bit of a struggle, but again, nothing that I would say um, w was overly difficult for me. Um, I did, one of the one of the first times I, I faced a challenge was when I got to Assumption College and I got homesick. Um, that was a little bit of a struggle. And then more recently, um, as first year principal at Oxford High School, uh, it was a struggle in the sense of I really had, you know, my wife was, was sick and had, um, you know, cancer. And so that presented a challenge um, because I was a first year principal and I had a commute for the first time, you know, living in Swansea and working at Durfee High School. It's a 10 minute commute. When I um, became principal of Oxford High School, I had an hour commute. And so that was, you know, new to me. And then my wife being sick. And then um, while she was sick, she was also pregnant with Sophia. And so I would honestly say that was the first time I faced a significant struggle in my life. Oh, she must she must have been if, if you now. Yeah, so uh, we're very fortunate. Yes. She had great doctors, and she is um, healthy, um, and I'm very very thankful for that. Um, but that was, I, you know, that would be the first time I would say I really um, struggled, and it was really just because I had a lot, you know, going on outside of. My professional, um, you know, being principal is a very difficult job. Um, <laughs> can I, can never imagine something like that is ever going to be easy. Yeah, so it's one of those things where when you finally, you know, become principal and you're responsible for every decision that's made, even if you're not the one making that decision, it, it can be very stressful. And um, one of the things that I take pride in is. Um, Anything that I'm associated with, you know, good is not good enough for me. I want it to be great. Um, and as part of Dartmouth High School, that's my hope for our high school is that we're not just a good high school, that we are a great high school and that we're constantly trying to be the very best high school we can be. Um, you know, and so. So I, I also read that um, you took Oxford High School to a level four school. I think it was level four, right? Level three, three to, to, level, to level one. Mm -hmm. What was the challenge and what was the, the problem 
that presented itself that prevented it from moving up before? Sure. So uh, first off, no principal moves a school um, by themselves. Um, the teachers worked really hard. Our students worked really hard as well. Um, Oxford is a small town. It's, it's not... Um, Financially, it's very different from Dartmouth. We're very fortunate here in Dartmouth to have um, a stable, our, our town itself is very stable financially, and that's, you know, um, that always helps. Um, in Oxford, that wasn't the case. The tax base was not very big in Oxford, and so funding was always one of those challenges. Um, and we were constantly trying to expand opportunities for kids, but without increasing the funding. Um, so we had to get creative. We did things like we changed the schedule, um, and in changing the schedule, it allowed for more opportunities for kids. Um, we increased the number of advanced placement courses that were at Oxford High School during my tenure there, um, and really we just tried to raise the expectations for students, teachers, and administrators. You know, and again, it's it's that drive to to constantly improve what you're doing and to be the very best at what you're doing. That's really. Um, I would say what defined uh, my time at Oxford High School. So what sort of advice, actually, what surprised you about trying to move out on your own? Other than the, the aforementioned um, homesickness, what mm -hmm. really surprised you and, and shocked you? And what struggle didn't happen with you moving out on your own and moving to? So you're talking about when I was a freshman at Assumption College? Yes. Um, so for the first time... I'd say I felt, I felt the challenge of, as I mentioned, I came from a working class family. Um, and so my time at, um, up at Assumption, it was the first time I really felt like there was a divide between um, myself financially and some of the other uh, kids who were um, also freshmen in my dorm and whatnot. Um, and so I think that was part of it. I also had been um, dating a young lady for several years while I was in high school, um, and we broke up um, my freshman year at Assumption. So that certainly, you know, re the relationship aspect um, was a challenge. And then again, you know, I'm not ashamed to say that I am a, a homebody. You know, I enjoy being home. I had a great relationship, still have a great relationship with my mom and dad. And so being, um, you know, seeing them uh, really, um, you know, I think probably had an impact that freshman, my freshman year. I, I probably, in hindsight, was not ready for all of those things. Um, you know, and it was also for the first time in several years that I didn't um, play football anymore and so that probably uh had a dramatic impact i think looking back on it as well for the first time since you know fifth grade i didn't belong to any team you know um so when you asked me earlier about the role you know what had an impact in growing up i mentioned athletics and it's really being a part of a team um and that sense of belonging that comes with being part of a team um, my freshman year in Assumption for the first time, I didn't have that. And I think that that probably had a major impact on me being homesick and, you know, missing my friends, missing, you know, my former teammates and things like that. What sort of advice would you give someone who is struggling through similar experiences as you, whether, whether it's homesickness, whether it's, it's going through that breakup, the type of the relationship, or just feeling that divide between themselves and their parents or themselves and their hometown or... Advice for someone who's struggling. That's interesting. Um, I would say to just, you, you just got to keep going because it does get better. Um, and I've learned to, I think if you, you ask people who are close to me, they, one of the things they say is that I'm pretty level-headed. Um, and so I, I think I really learned through those struggles and seeing that things do turn out okay. And I'm a big believer now that everything happens for a reason. And you might not understand what that reason is at the moment um but I, I again i i believe that you know everything does work itself out and everything does happen for a reason so i guess my advice would be just keep going because things will get better um you know and and i think people have to understand that it's okay to struggle life is life is difficult life is challenging and so too often i feel like we see struggle or we equate struggle or even failure with um, a lack of success. And I, I think that the only time you're ultimately not going to be successful is the time when you decide to quit, you know. 
Thank you so much for being with us, Mr. Tebow. I just have one more question sure. for you. Uh, today's theme were for the big idea, for the first section of our show, was hindsight. So if you could go back in time and give yourself a letter, what would you tell yourself to try and make yourself better or, of, or avoid something or like that? That's an interesting question. So I, I think that, and actually I, I've kind of reflected on, it, it's a timely uh, interview because this past week I shared with people like um, Ms. Xavier and, and some of the other folks who were involved in graduation that um, this graduation at Dartmouth High School was my most stress-free graduation. And so in hindsight, I would, again, just <laughs> reiterate to myself that everything works out, and as long as you've put in your best effort, things will take care of themselves. Um, and I think that, you know, my time in Oxford, I didn't allow myself to enjoy the moment as often as I should have or could have. Um, and so I think that that would be the, in hindsight, advice I would, I would give myself. Enjoy the moment, um, you know. Thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Tebow. Thank you. It's a pleasure. We'll be right back with the last segment of our show. Stick, stick around. Welcome back Hello. to our final little segment. I'm here with Andrew Vega. Hi, Andrew. Hi. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Yeah. Not like I saw you last walk at all. <laughs> or like five seconds ago. Or, oh yeah, that I saw you there too. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our final section of the gathering in where we will bring in some random student off the street. In this case, it's not as random because we don't really have the time to pick up a random student off the street. Hi, Andrew. Except I wasn't also on the street as well. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> so we're just going to ask some basic questions just because people don't actually get to know people anymore. So what's one thing that's happening in your, your life right now that you think people will be interested to hear? Well, this is interesting. Also, I think you chose the wrong person for interesting, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> you know, finals are on the corner, so I'm kind of like I'm on that finals grind. I'm literally going through my bio textbook, reading chapters in it. It's not fun, but other than that, summer's rolling around, planning a lot of vacations, um, weekend stay in NYC, which is always my favorite thing about the summer, is just going to New York. It's a beautiful, beautiful city. Absolutely. Uh, I actually like Boston better, personally. It's just, just quieter city. Yeah, cities in general. I don't like cities. You general. don't like cities? No. The environment of a city, it just feels as if there's so much to do. And it feels as if... It's overwhelming, and I also yeah. I also like the small town feel of well, it's not really a small town like Dartmouth. It's because not. A small I, I don't town. know. I'm antisocial, so I don't know people. Yeah. But that's a, it's it's um different. Yeah, I feel as if also we're not a crazy small town. You wouldn't know everybody. I mean, you know people that are well known. I just got here. You did. Yeah. And then, well, there's not much to know really. <laughs> we're not crazy small. We're not crazy large. We're just, eh. In the middle so for a size. If someone walked up to you, hey, tell me something that most people wouldn't really think about you. Oh. Hmm. That is actually a really good question. Oh. Well, I'm not really much of a people person, to be honest. 
people tell me, oh, you seem very outgoing, is uh, I'm not really as outgoing as it may seem. I'd rather, like, do conversations with people that I really know and I really trust and like. And basically, that's it. Fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it, yep. Yeah, man. You understand. So, thank you for joining me, Andrew. Yep, this was really fun. The All whole right. idea of this podcast is a really good idea, too. Yeah, I wonder who else is stealing it. <laughs> I wonder who else is stealing that, too. <laughs> Today's music was provided by Chill Hop, Joe Kim Karad, and Canals, Mr. Kaffer. Bonus points. And uh, Ray, uh, Ray, uh, Ray RZY for the wonderful rendition of the Imperial March, who was used for our very own principal. <laughs> Big, like, big and powerful, just yeah, like our absolutely. theater. There you go. Thank you. Uh, we will be continuing this show next year, starting out on whatever day we decide to come back and re-record. So, thank you. Uh, yep. Thank you for joining me, Andrew. Not a problem and at we'll all. see you all next time.